early in the morning from the UK. And I'm going to spend my first few minutes talking a little bit about the rise and fall, and hopefully um, the second coming of economic history in Australia. And um, I, I have a little roadmap here for the next 30 minutes. I'm going to begin with a disclaimer, um, and we can get that out of the way rather quickly. I'm not an economic historian of Australia. I um, don't actually know very much about the economic history of Australia, um, apart from uh, the work of my um, close colleague uh, here in Oxford, um, Oswald colleague, Deborah Oxley. Um, but I have worked um, for many years in economic history, and I've worked both as an economic historian in economics faculties, both in the United States and in the UK. And I've worked as an economic historian in a history faculty at the University of Oxford, for example. And I'm finally now working as an economic historian in a freestanding economic history department at the London School of Economics. So I have some experience of working as an economic historian in different institutional settings. And that turns out to be quite important in terms of the potential explanations of the decline of economic history. And each of these potential explanations also has implications for how resurgence recovery might take place. Um, and I've sketched here four potential explanations that we're going to have a look at in, in this 30 minute session. Um, the first I've called um, a neglected child of two distracted and increasingly disinterested parents. Um, and we'll look at that in, in more detail in a minute. And in actual fact, that's the kind of standard explanation for the decline of economic history in different times and places. So this is really the explanation that we see used in the UK, for example, to explain um, the retrenchment of economic history. Um, but to give this some particular Australian context, um, we, we also have explanations that suggest that economic history was crowded out um, by economics um, in an institutional and resources crunch. So that's a kind of particular Australian spin on, on, on the first explanation. And also a, a third explanation, um, which um, I'm going to look at more closely, which is um, advocated by Claire Wright in her outstanding her new book, um, explains how freestanding departments, Australian economic history developed through freestanding departments, and uh, this led to isolation from other supporting disciplines and also perhaps turn research interests um, inwardly. Um, the final kind of explanation um, is one associated with um, Andy Seltzer's recent article in the Australian Economic History Review, where he argues that Australia was very close to adopt the best practice of economic historians elsewhere, and now they're catching up, and that's a, 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 a source of um, optimism for the future. So each of these explanations then has got um, implications um, for how future researchers might take place. And this is um, a, a figure taken from David Meredith and Deborah Oxley's um, excellent paper on um, the uh, rise and fall of Australian economic history. I can really recommend it to, to people who are interested. It's in the Rubik Handbook of Global Economic History. And um, you can see there the very dramatic um, expansion of economic history in the um, 60s, beginning in the 60s and, and running right through um, the 80s, and then, uh, in fact, a rather precipitous decline. So let's have a look at them at the first kind of explanation, which is the, this argument um, that we find both in the US, the UK, in Europe as well, that um, economic historians really are the neglected child of two distracted parents. Um, economic history 
is, as Claire Wright argues, inherently interdisciplinary, but it's got additional complications. It straddles both the social sciences and the humanities. So it's, it's actually, um, in Oxford it would be called interdivisional as well as interdisciplinary. It actually involves both quantitative and qualitative evidence, and um, those, the loyalties of the parents to this child were, I think, um, strained even further by developments within both history and economics um, in the, the 70s and 80s, particularly by the 80s. Um, we can think here, of course, that history took a cultural turn and embraced postmodernism, um, whereas economics um, famously took a neoliberal turn and fixated on markets and became um, what my students call micro macro metrics. And so there was a kind of reduction in the contents um, of e economics itself. And um, of course, this meant that, that economists became disinterested in anything other than capitalism. So, of course, that meant that they were disinterested in most of history and most of the world where capitalism, you know, wasn't the way in which the economy was organized. And, of course, economics became theory and technique heavy. Um, most papers involved theory plus the model, sometimes hypothesis testing, um, with econometrics um, increasingly uh, common and increasingly multivariate regression analyses and even and ever more complicated um, regression techniques. So historians found economic history increasingly incomprehensible and frequently boring um, and um, at odds with the fashionable approaches of their discipline. Um, and economists have found economic history only tangentially relevant. And after mastering micro macro metrics, uh, students have little stomach for studying the context of, of questions or of going to archives and of um, devising their own um, empirical evidence. Um, now, the, these themes occur in pretty much all the explanations for the um, decline of economic history. Um, in in uh, Australia, but there are, as I said at the beginning, other kinds of um, things also um, initiated. So Meredith and Oxley, in in their contribution to the Rutledge um, Handbook, um, argue, and they use a lot of quantitative historical evidence to support this. They argue that although these ideological, theological, theoretical trends were apparent. It was also to do with um, the institutional arrangements whereby economic history was located in packages economics, business, and commerce. And these were geared towards vocational training and useful qualifications. And in the tightening resources after the 1960s, many university administrators began to protect core activities and they restructured curriculum which margin marginalised and eventually eliminated economic history courses from many um, overall degree courses. So this is really a story of really vocational education that it, this links up with what um, Claire Wright calls the Scottish model in Australian higher education. Um, um, and you can see it if you look at um, Oxley and Meredith's um, graph here, because you could figure here, because you could, you can in fact, sorry, you can in fact compare what happens in economic history with what happens in commerce. So this is a kind of drying up of student demand directed by administrators who are protecting whole courses um, within their um, rather um, vocationally orientated higher education. Now, Claire Wright has a different take on this. You can see here, this is a picture of her forthcoming book. I think it's, it's actually um, hot from the press, this cover. And um, she uh, provides us with a rich prosopographical history. She interviews economic historians. She looks at um, materials that they have um, 
shared with her about their experiences, and she describes how the expansion of the subject in the 1950s coincided really with an expansion of the higher educational system. And so um, people were relaxed about the wealth of courses, about hiring, um, because in fact the whole system was expanding. But in and this meant that expansion often took place in Australia rather differently from in the UK and in the United States, because it took place through the formation of separate departments. And Claire argues that this actually had adverse feedback effects into economic history, because economic historians didn't forge links, they weren't um, fertilized, their ideas and their imagination and their techniques were not fertilized by contact with, with other disciplines. And, um, and then when there is a tightening of budgets associated with the contraction of, in fact, the cohorts of students speaking through the system, um, the university administration really um, starts to, to, in fact, look at these departments and say, well, where's the students, you know, where's the, where's the research? And um, she sees this as really um, together providing the, the, the decline of the subject. Very interesting book, I advise you to have a read of this. Um, and finally, I want to think about the uh, look from uh, the journal, from the Australian Economic History Review. And here you, you've got some two nice papers, there's the classic paper by Stephen Morgan, and um, Shanahan, um, which looks at the supply of economic history um, in the Australian Economic History Review, and um, using a lot of bibliometric data, they look at the methodological approach, the JDL classification, function of study, um, author information, and this has been extended to 2017 um, with three additional pieces of information by Andy Seltzer in um, a, an article published um, in um, 2018. And uh, interestingly, um, Andy adds um, really whether the, um, <laughs> the additional pieces of information that are really cited, so rep this represents the direction in which economic history is, is going. Um, citation counts, the number of observations in any data set uses, and whether in fact econometrics is used. And Andy uses this to argue that um, the Australian Economic History Review, reflecting Australian economic historians, was a late comer to the new techniques, and in particular was a late comer to big data. He shows that all 13 of the papers that have more than a thousand observations were published since 2001. And, um, and that there's a lag here behind. Um, the big three behind the journal of economic history, explorations, and the economic history review. But he also shows that the Australian Economic History Review is competitive with other regional economic history journals. And um, comparison here might be, for instance, with the Scandinavian Economic History Review. And he also shows, and this is um, taken from um, the Australian Economic History Review. He also shows that, in fact, um, Australian economic historians are catching up. So regression analysis is becoming more um, common in the journal, more, more articles are using these kinds of econometric techniques, and data sets are increasing in size um, and range. So several of these um, interpretations Claire Wright's interpretation, and um, particularly Andy Seltzer's um, representing, you know, the, the, the kind of um, the late adoption and the emergence of CLIO in Australia, um, the increasing use of, of um, common metrics, they um, have some cautious optimism regarding the future trends. And this is backed up by a, a look at, for instance, um, new hires, um, the stabilization of numbers in economic history in Australian higher ed, 
Um, and I, I think that does suggest um, that there's grounds for what they all describe as cautious optimism. Um, I think that there are some other pieces of evidence that we might use to shore up this cautious optimism. Um, there is a resurgence of interest generally in areas where Australian researchers have experience and traditional interests. Um, I listed some here, you can think of many others. Migration, interest in indigenous people, um, anthropometrics, which was you know, pioneered by um, Australian economic historian Steve Nicholas, was very important in the, in the initial um, well known papers in anthropometrics, um, as was Deb Oxley, for example. And um, of course, interest in Southeast Asia and interest in China. Um, very soon. Um, there is also more big data coming on stream in Australia. And um, Andy Seltzer shared with me communication from Hamish Maxwell Stewart about the Tasmanian longitudinal data, uh, which looks absolutely fabulous, you know, and really would be fun and, and, and it's very interesting to work on. Um, there is also some resurgent interest in economic history from both parent fields, and I think this might be an underlying cause for cautious optimism. So, in history, we've seen the demise of postmoderns and the rise of interests in varieties of capitalism. Um, there's a, a, the new history of capitalism, although um, scholars in these areas tend to want to distance themselves from traditional economic history, um, which they see as, as, as um, going to the dark side with some of their theoretical and um, empirical approaches. Um, but there's also significant interest in ecological history and in global history, both of which um, Australia is, is well positioned um, to, to contemplate. In economics, um, the financial crisis of 2008 was heralded as, you know, causing economists to turn to the past to have a look at um, financial crises in the past. Um, the, you know, there was a whole lot of a new interest in the 1930s, for example. Um, I myself don't think that particular um, research into interest in economic history lasted much longer you know, than, than a couple of days. Um, but there is also interest in, for instance, climate change, which might cause economists to think historically. Um, and here also interest in globalization. And uh, really a, a very important contribution was Piketty's work on inequality, which used theory, which used empirical evidence, but which was quite innocent of complicated econometrics and so incredibly accessible and wonderfully written, by the way. So, um, you know, it reached out to a mass audience. It became a coffee table book um, and nothing like commercial success to fire up economists' interest, I think. But I want to express some caution here. Um, and this is a caution, caution a little bit different from the cautious optimism um, of, you know, um, the bibliometrician, um, Andy Seltzer, or, or you know, uh, Claire's careful prosopography. Um, I want to ask, is a more secure future obtainable only if economic history becomes a subfield of economics, and adopting this methodology of focus? And freestanding departments may have restricted contact with neighboring disciplines, but absorption into economics, I think, also threatens interdisciplinarity. And I'm speaking here, as I mentioned in the beginning, as somebody who has worked for many years, over 25 years in total, in economics departments. So, what is the cost of security? What does life in an economics department mean for the future of economic history? Um, will economic historians be captured, as Persephone has been captured here by Hades? Will, economics, will economic historians be captured by their bigger, um, more powerful hosts. And this, I'd like to contrast this with 
um, the quotation that Claire finishes her book with, um, which is from Deb Oxley, where she says, I want to see economic history flourish, not narrowly as a little branch of economics, but as a big eclectic agenda. So an independent life for economic history and economics. Well, what I want to finish with is to suggest here that economics itself has moved on. And the new emphasis is not just on demonstrating associations amongst variables using econometrics, but as Andy Seltzer himself points out in his 2018 article, as showing causal economic relationships. Causality in, has become the, the key word in both econometrics and in economics. And causality in econometrics requires identification. So I went to a conference quite recently, and every single paper, somebody in the audience, and this is supposed to be uh, a, a conference that reached out you know, to ancillary disciplines. Every single paper was greeted by people in the audience jumping up and saying, what's your identification strategy? And this rise of, of, of increased fixation on identification of, and uh, trying to grasp causality in contexts where simultaneity is important, where feedback effects are endogenous, where um, ubiquitous, you know, where, where in fact um, it's very, very difficult to establish causality, has led to the rise of experimental economics. And randomized control trials or RTCs, for instance, have come to dominate the evaluation of projects and policies in development economics. So to, to, to get at causality, the argument is economics must, must in fact model itself on science. We must in fact try and, and develop randomized control trials. And this has held a new approaches and new techniques in economics and in economic history. And this is, of course, what comes about if we are included in economics faculties. So economic historians, too, have begun to focus on natural experiments with as if random assignment to treatments and control groups and to the econometrics that goes along with that, including Regression discontinuity designs, um, use of instrumental variables um, to, to kind of represent as if a random assignment. So there are some really positive implications of this um, new interest. The first is that if the research design is sufficiently strong, really rather simple and transparent quantification and identify causation in natural experiments. And I want to just illustrate this, if I've got time here, with a historical example. Um, and this is the classic case of John Snow's demonstration that cholera was a waterborne disease. Um, some of you may know about Snow on cholera, but um, what he, he did here was he pointed to um, a very significant natural experiment. And this is that water supplies um, for London were provided by and large by two very large water companies, um, Lambeth on the one hand and Southwark um, and Vauxhall on the other. And um, these households were as if randomly assigned to these water companies because the decisions about piping some had been taken years before. And in fact, landlords had made the decision. Individual householders often didn't even know which company they were, in fact, deriving their water from. However, in 1852, Lambeth moved its inlet pipe upstream, accessing water on the Thames before it had passed through London and before it received gallons of raw sewage and became horrendously contaminated. So Snow shows that the death rate from cholera per 10,000 cases in the epidemic of 1853 or was 315 among households supplied by Suffolk and Vauxhall and 37 among households supplied by Lambeth. The research design here is so strong and so convincing that 
um, you have to accept, I, I think it's, the, the assumption of random assignment is really um, very, very convincing. And that's, that suggests that this, the simple summary statistics were enough to demonstrate that cholera was a waterborne disease. So this is an example of a very robust, very convincing natural experiment, a historical experiment. So natural experiments then are the order of the day. They're the fashionable thing in economics and economic history. And the past as a source of social science natural experiments uh, then opens up. And there's an opportunity here for a genuine and important synergy. It, these natural experiments can involve social science issues, not just economics issues. And that's why I chose particularly, although it's such a beautiful example too, the John Snow and cholera, because of course this is an epidemiological example as well as an economic example. And the econometrics here can be simple, transparent, accessible. Uh, Snow only used here, you know, the proportions and um, different in proportions to demonstrate the relationships. Um, furthermore, the analysis of any natural experiment has to be accompanied, indeed buttressed, by what Thad Dunning in his great talk on natural experiments in social science calls causal process observations. And this involves auxiliary evidence that assignment was as if random, that a credible causal process existed, and that the mechanisms in such a process can be demonstrated in the contextual evidence. These causal process observations essentially involve knowledge of context. Painstaking legwork that economists have called shoe leather research. Shoe leather research is often qualitative and it's the terrain of economic historians. Here we are enormously comfortable. And um, what I'm suggesting here is that natural experiments with, in fact, their shoe leather research surroundings provide a fruitful blend of qualitative and quantitative methodologies within which economists and economic historians can partner up. So a new and fruitful partnership. Um, yes, but let's get back to the cautious part of my optimism here. Um, natural experiments are not so easy to uncover as I might have suggested. A lot of shoe leather research is needed to actually dig them up. Um, and there is a danger that the, the, um, the attractiveness of natural experiment research design might pull us away from the important research questions of our time. And this is an issue that's raised in the context of development economies, uh, economics by Angus Deaton in his really powerful, uh, really powerful critique of uh, um, the, the um, random control trials um, revolution in development of economics. If you look at his Keynes lecture uh, in 2008, it's a very, really, very powerful piece of, of writing. Um, so perhaps this new approval partnership is only a part of the big eclectic agenda that Deborah Oxley argued was economic history's ideal future, and only a part two of the revitalized and genuinely interdisciplinarity that Claire Wright thinks is the best outcome for our subject. Um, I think we have to keep this big eclectic agenda and our interdisciplinarity firmly in mind if we are to resist um, becoming not merely a little branch of economics, um, but a captain of the economics. Thank you all very much. I hope you've enjoyed the conference and I hope you've enjoyed this contribution. With cautious optimism, it sounds like an accountant sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I am John Rosset from the London School of Economics. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me to make uh, this half an hour presentation about uh, what I think about uh, the new research topic in economic history. Um, um, before to begin, I will explain a bit the motivation behind this 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 talk and what what is the the questions that I want to discuss mainly. Uh, later I will discuss where they are the general the, the debates that are already closed in the discipline that are no longer useful or even some people think that are still open. What are the further debates that are open? And later I will discuss about what are the topics. Okay. How I get the topics uh, is very I make two things. One, I check what already the top journals are publishing. And also, you can use my internal um, uh, views because I have been already seven years editor of the European Review of Economic History. This means that I, I can observe how the profession has been changed because I get the, the submissions of the people and how the people are moving. And in general, how are the debates in general? Obviously, it's a, uh, a strongly continent European view, okay? Because even I am based in London. You know, the, the European Review of Economic History is a, basically a, a continental journal, but we publish from everywhere, and also obviously, given that I London, I attend a lot of British meetings. I am not, has been so much in the American meetings, but we form more or less what Americans are doing. Okay, good. What is the motivation? One thing that, uh, I don't know, I, I, I get my PhD in 1998, centuries ago, and I began in the profession in 1991. And uh, uh, from there, from the fifth year, what we observe in economic history, or what we call historical economics now, is that we have really, really a robust bad health. We are, have been in crisis every year of my life as academic, but we have survived every year. This is that we should be conscious that it's not easy to be economic uh, historian. It's a difficult profession. And we should assume a second point that is very important, is that we are not much more appreciated by history. In fact, I will talk later that every time we are less appreciated by historians. And we also not very strongly appreciated by economic people. I spent a lot of my life in departments of economics. I can say that normally they don't really like about economic history. And we should be conscious that this happened. Not that we cannot, probably we cannot change them. If another thing that is important, is that when another discipline which economic history is for the agenda, is not for the economic history agenda. This means that our agenda should be independent of what another discipline is one or, or one to This means what we should do, and here I, I, will, I have many years ago a conversation with Jim Williamson, and he said in public, and he said to me, say, if you want to thrive as economic history, you should be relevant. Okay? This, my strong advice is everything that you do as an economic historian, every, every topic that you want to do should be relevant in the big debates. Okay? And I think that Jeff Wilson is a good example of how you can shape the debates, how you can participate in the debates. You should be relevant. This is that you should be informed for what is today uh, important. Not only important for economics, important for the society, social science, and so I will talk later about this. Okay, well. What debates are already more or less killed or finished in economic history and probably we should not lose a lot of time? I remember in the uh, 90s, early 2000s, maybe 90s, this debate about uh, analytical versus narrative approaches. I think that this has been closed. If you open the top journals in economic history, basically 75, 80, 90 percent of the papers are analytical. This means that and obviously, you can continue with the narrative approach, but if you try to have a huge impact, you should have an analytical approach. Another debate that has been forcefully closed by the Americans, and I like a lot, is debate about global history, revisionist history, and the role of economic history. Seriously, I think that we should not engage in the global history debates. I give you an example. Now they are trying to open again the debate about the role of slavery in British economic growth. This is really all. From the point of view of economic history, this is a debate closed probably before I did my dissertation with very famous paper for John Mokir about demand side growth and the British Industrial Revolution. I don't feel that we should come back to that. We should not follow this agenda. Obviously, we can go to the to slavery, but 
not going with the same idea for global history. Obviously, global history is important, but not from the point of view that they are taking. I will come back to this, okay? Another debate that is really close, and every time it's much more close, is that it's obviously that it's important to publish books, but if you want to be relevant, you should publish journal articles. And journal articles are killing the market. And, and, and this is because the role of the big database, if you open uh, Google Scholar or you open Ecolit or you open uh, uh, Web of Science, uh, what you get is articles. This means that to get information about books is much more difficult. Books are not online. This means that probably your book is difficult to read if you don't have access to a very expensive library. Those books in the history are very expensive. And this helps produce a, normally the day-to-day -day life. And also, if you're in teaching, or, or studies obviously like a lot journal articles <laughs> because they can read in the computer and, and books are a huge mess for everybody. This is that I, I think that economic history is following the trend of economics, not so strong as economics where nobody publish already books, but we're moving to this to this trend that journal articles are the basis of the debate. Okay. Another debate that is close even now is when we can look at the at the the consequence is that every time we have much more open publications and much more diffusion systems, it means that every time it's much more important that the people read you and know what you are doing and so on. This is why the, uh, I, I think that not everybody in economics is in favor of this, but economics has learned a lot with the working paper approach. Okay, when you produce something, you produce a working paper, you put free in the in the website, you to try that you're open your working papers and papers in Rebecca and so on. Many people read your knowledge and you try to publish this later at this open publication. And now with the new system, even the journal articles will be for free. And, and this makes you popular, follow, and the people can follow what you are doing and you can be in the frontier of knowledge because there are these working papers um, uh, wall where you have all these publications. Okay? This means that, that this is really important. If you want to, to make something important in economic history, you should be taken to the economies and go for open publications. Okay? Going for working papers and this two-tier system. If I publish my working paper, I later try to get in a journal or try to get in a book, putting all the working papers together or something similar. But don't forget that working papers are essential. Okay? Good, famous economists publish a lot of working papers. And these working papers finish with articles. Why this is important? Because articles are so slow, journals are so slow. Even the fastest journal in the profession, uh, my journal is one of the fastest, but less than one year is basically impossible. Okay? It means that basically if you get at the paper and you have revisions and so on, if you are happy to be accepted probably in one year and a half or one year on the on the journal, this is a lot of time in yourself. Okay. Another thing that is very important is that. The number of the literature is growing exponentially, and every time it's much more difficult to control the literature. The amount of articles, the amount of articles in economic history has not grown in relative terms, but in absolute terms has grown a lot. To give you an example, when my journal begins in 1998, uh, we published 12 articles per year. Now we publish something like uh, uh, 52, 55 articles per year. Okay, it means that the number of submissions has grown to, to cover this enormous amount of articles. And we have a space. The, the same happened with the Economic History Review. If you remember, the Economic History Review about 10 years ago published four or five articles per number and now has 10 articles per number. This basically has multiplied by two. Okay, it means that every time we have much more articles, the literature is growing. and, and this. And one important change now is that we need to share our data. It's a big change, okay? And this is very important. This is a, a debate that we cannot change, okay? Uh, the literature is growing of size and will be a lot of open source data. We'll go back to this later. And finally, another important thing is that we are imitating, I think that there are representatives from Andy Seltzer, that probably you know everybody very well, and, and Hammersmith about this movement in authorship also in economic history. Okay, we have we have to publish so many papers, the papers are so complicated. Probably you need much more than one expertise and, and if you want to succeed in this world, probably you need co-authors. And working with co-authors is, is part of your of the professional. This means that 
you cannot stop this. No longer is an individual topic where you are a historian. The only specialist in, I remember when I was doing my, my master dissertation in, in Barcelona, uh, when I, I made the, 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 the presentation, one of the members of the jury said, ah, Joan, you will be the, the most important specialist in banking in Catalonia in the 1860s. And I feel that was a waste of time. Okay, this is the problem. We no longer can be specialists in a very small thing. We need to be specialists in many things. This is why co-authorship is very important. And I, I think that this is more or less the debates that no longer are important in, for the future of the profession. I think that more or less is here, the, the future is already decided. Okay, what is the, food, the battleground that we have now? The big, big battleground, and this is the big problem for the profession, is what we call big data public database. Okay, I will explain later. Many, many of the new papers, compared with the papers of 10 years ago, has huge amounts of data. And you need to be first to be able to process this data, to convert to a numeric system. And second, you should be able to, to use this data in a formal way. And this has been a huge change. And there are this expansion everywhere of public databases to make this much more easier. But even so, big data is the big challenge of the profession. If you look at the, at the people that are now in the frontier, many uh, in top American universities, they are moving to this big data issue. Okay? Everyone is moving to the big data. And what you study, at some moment, will need big data. Okay? Uh, related to this, we have uh, what we call the credibility revolution. That is a revolution in, in, in economics. That every time is that this question that is, in your relation, you have correlation of causation. This is a big, big topic. Probably you cannot longer publish in economic history with only correlations, and you need to be uh, understand what is a natural experiment and how to work on this. And another thing that is very important, and this is a big, big shock, and I think that the profession is not doing very well, is that um, many of the papers in economic history, the traditional ones, classical example, Jeff Williamson, are extremely old fashioned in terms of what the economic people are doing, what we call the new economics, for example, new international trade, or new economic geography, or new economic growth, has little, little impact on economic history. We still have many people publishing things that are very old-fashioned. And if we want to succeed, we need to take advantage of the, this new side of economics that also is much more close to the economic history interest and i think it's much more interesting then we should go behind or forget the pure neoclassical approach and to move to the much more recent approaches okay another big issue now and i think that giovanni federico gioni and has write a lot of very nice papers if you have time about this to read is that this difference between the, the, this group of people that are doing what they call residence studies versus traditional economic history, or what is normal economic history. What is a resilience study? Is this a study where you do? You discover something in the 16th century and say that this determined the good luck or bad luck of one country in the 21st century. Okay? And, and, and this idea basically um, has a lot of problems, but this is the trend in economics, but not the trend in economic history. I think that it should not be the trend in economic history. Okay, I think that they are happy what we are doing, but we should be conscious that apparently the growth in number of articles in economics is with these residence studies that has little to do with real economic history. Because if everything depends on something that happened three centuries ago, why why we, we need to live? We need only to wait that the past, the, the, the present. But I think that this is really historical, strongly historical. Okay, one thing that we have to do is that. <clears throat> In the developing countries, we have a kind of uh, decreasing rental situation. I think that in England, basically, if you want to enter in the, in the market of the British Industrial Revolution, entry barriers are so high because there are so many papers, so many topics that have been studied that your contribution could be ordinary or very difficult to be relevant. But, but we have much less studies in developing countries. In fact, it's a, basically, we have uh, even with this enormous increase in African economic history, they are touching basically the surface. And there are many people say that it's because there are no big data for the public countries. This is not true. There are big data, but you need to be much more you know, um, original to be 
especially. But there are a huge opportunity to move the research to developing countries and to be relevant for these countries because basically the developed countries they are overcrowded. We have so many papers, but everything has been studied, even which change of thought. Okay. Another thing that is very important, and I observe a lot in the European, is that links with another social science, outside history and outside the economics are very important. For example, I will talk later about two. One obviously is um, political science, because political science has begun to impact economic history, and economic history has begun to impact political science, and obviously geography that is not, economic geography that is my specialization. Okay, and this is quite important. Another thing that is the future battleground is policy economic history outside core economic history journal. This means that the typical ones and outside the, the top four economic journals. Okay, for example, there are opportunities now to publish in the Journal of Economic Growth or Journal of Economic Geography, or there are many journals that publish economic history. Okay, and we should try to enter here. And finally, and this is very important. And uh, being head of the Department of LSE was one of my findings. If you look at the profession, the profession is white male, okay? Uh, and we need to solve this. It's a huge problem. It's not only a problem of economic history, it's also a problem of, of, of economics in general. But we need to solve this because if not, we are uh, accounting part of the history. We are forgetting, you know, 75% of the world population, okay? It means that we have a huge problem. That is mainly white male. Uh, and I remember being in conference where everybody was male and white, uh, typically. Or, for example, the another uh, in the European, we get we only in 25 years, we only have two female editors in 25 years. This is really bad. <laughs> we need to change this. Also, in terms of we need to attract these people to the profession to make the, the, the what we do much more relevant. Okay. What are, now we go to a project and you ask me, um, what are uh, the important topics uh, that we need to talk or what are the big topics that, that are uh, in economic history? And I call this, this, this slide the everlasting topics and are the topics that ever, ever, ever the people publish. Even I will explain later, don't publish the same than 10 years ago, okay? If, if you look, for example, yesterday I was looking to the Journal of Economic History, they have a classification of topics that they get applications, submissions. The number one is political economy, okay? But political economy is no longer like 20 years ago. Now every political economy paper that tries to be important is a political economy paper with natural experience. This is that you have papers where you have a natural experience, you have a, a kind of, I don't know, for example, in the European, we published this paper about what is the impact of this, um, of, the, of the, you know, Britain decided to close a lot of railways in the 1960s. And, and, and what is the impact on the vote in the next, in the uh, forthcoming elections? This is the typical paper. You have a, a shock and the impact, and you study the political economy. Okay, this is the new, new frontier. This is one topic that is, you know, you look at hundreds of papers. New, new big topic, and mainly the American journals, more than the Europeans, is migration. But migration is one of the topics that has been much more spectacularly changed by micro data. Okay? What the people are doing now with migration is essential difference to the classical studies of Tim Hatton, for example. Okay? What they are doing is that to look at people, follow people, and study what happens with people. Things that they have samples of group of thousands of observations from census and they have the original census data and this is one of the huge impacts of economic history or science economic history this is hugely relevant and is very important because many of the results are contradictory what we expect from the very basic neoclassical papers and i think that this is one of the problems talking to people in australia say you should do that okay migrations Using microdata is one of the big topics. It's one of the topics on economic history is strongly relevant. Okay. International trade, there are less papers now than 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but the papers have changed also strongly that the, the new methods. Also, the new methods imply a lot of data. Okay, if you look at the debates now in international trade, you need a lot of microdata. For example, there are these papers that use. You don't use the total amount of exports, you use 
all the composition of exports to analyze how the country is conducting the format. Okay. Another thing that I think that is arriving into the end is this long-run economic growth. Uh, all these papers that you have uh, observed about the uh, Spanish long-run economic growth of Leandro and Carlos Albernogal, or the papers of uh, Stephen Broberry, or the papers of uh, Federico. All these papers that use this uh, that database with wages and try to, 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 to arrive to some implications about long-run economic growth. I feel that this, this literature is arriving to the end. We cannot get a lot more. Okay? If you want to make long run economic growth, probably you should improve a lot what Nelson has done already and, and to get a much more comparative system. Okay? Another everlasting system, and uh, I think that these guys are very competitive, is the people that make in the international financial, financial system. They work. It's, it's very surprising because 10 years ago, I feel that gold standard was still, and there are still in papers in gold standard. There are a lot of papers in transmission of crisis, there are a lot of papers. But if you want to do international financial system, you need big data. These guys are using millions of observations. They are using this incredible database that has been created. And new methods. Okay, you can no longer use the traditional time series. Nobody cares about you. Okay, bars and much more sophisticated things. Probably here you should buy to uh, Chris Mason or Albert Ritz that will explain you what the crisis is you can do with this data. Okay? Another topic that is still very important is innovation and technological change. Obviously, I think that the patenting debate is a bit close. But if you go further, for example, we innovate, we innovate, how technological change take place. Again, with big data, you can go very further. And there are a lot of new papers and a, and a lot of new literature. Institutions <clears throat> is another topic that are still alive. The problem with institutions is a kind of definition. And basically, the problem is that the people are looking, are moving to the like in political economy to get natural experiments. We have this institution. I don't know, and I, I try to explain the consequence of this institution in economic growth or something similar. The problem with this kind of studies is, is that are very nice, very self-contained, but how much change or Broad understanding of the economic aspect of our country first. And finally, and this is the last topic, is that it's, it's like happening like in economics. <clears throat> uh, if you make a sense of the United States, you are, uh, your topic is poor <laughs> immediately. And this sometimes is, is bad for the people like me that don't make a sense in the United States. Even now, I'm writing a paper about the United States. Because uh, sometimes things that are important for the United States, when you try to publish internationally, they don't really appreciate. Okay? And this is a huge. This is more or less what uh, I, I think since I, 1988, uh, when I began in the professional I my dissertation has been everlasting topics. You know, if you read the journals, there are plenty of articles about this. What are the new, the new things? And I think that's yes, the most important, everybody think. Okay. If you look in the last years, the standard big shocks has been the new, new big topic that has appeared. Uh, for example, pandemics now, but before the, the financial crisis. The, middle, the people have discovered that big shocks are important in economic history. And for example, we have a, again a lot of, of papers about the, the, the big depression. Okay? The, this is a, a new comeback. Okay? But every time it's much more important, these big shocks papers, basically, because <clears throat> Uh, because you are allowed to make natural experiments and are very important. And we are discovering a lot of things. How big shocks has long run impact and so on. Okay? Second topic that is very important and is growing is what we call historical economic geography. That I should say that I was one of the pioneers of this, but now it's many people. You look at every year, I think that five, six, seven percent of the, uh, the total uh, production now in economic history is economic geography. Why economic geography is so important? Well, because history matters. Okay, geographers are very proud. In fact, they write out the paper saying history matters. When you look at the space, when you look what happened in the space, every every time you should to, to, to look at minus one, because the, the things have resilience and the space is difficult to change. When you put a city, it's difficult, difficult, difficult to change of price the city and how the city is located as impact for today. This is, a, this is a huge, huge topic. Also, you can use a lot of data on the people. For example, um, one of my candidates that now is in Oxford, 
Matthew Artaxi, he made a thesis about, about, about um, Ethiopia. So how do you can make a thesis about Ethiopia? Basically because the, the Italian colonizer make a lot of maps and you can convert the maps on data and you have a lot of information about Ethiopia that nobody knows that you can use. Okay? Then he can make a kind of a study about the impact of uh, Italian uh, public works in Ethiopia today using maps. Okay? It's, it's quite, there are a lot of these kind of things. You can, you can do a lot of things and you can get this big data without data. It's a super easy thing. You don't need a census of Ethiopia in 1950 that don't really exist. You need maps of Ethiopia to make that. Okay? Another topic that is growing and growing is urban economic history that is this uh, thing about uh, um, uh, cities and so on. And, and, and for example, all the studies about mortality in cities, the studies about, about the impact of housing and so on is a new topic that is growing. Another thing that is very important now is the non-economical cost. Okay, not only look at, at uh, very strongly related to political economy, not only look at, at, at the economics, uh, look to write papers, for example, about political vote, crime, ethnicity, and so this kind of social impacts. Obviously, a topic that is very important is inequality, Piketty and Beyond. Uh, but this is, has been very different. It's no longer what uh, we make in the, with goodness and this big uh, data. We have this data that is based in Europe. Um, um, Neil Cummings at, um, uh, uh, at my department, he has, uh, has uh, collected all, all the, all the all, uh, millions of observations about, about, uh, about inventories for most uh, in UK. To, to analyze wealth inequality. This means that, for example, we have these projects on family budgets to reconstruct family budgets, these projects on poverty levels, these projects on big incomes, and this project very interesting on wealth inequality, how, how rich people and so on. This is, inequality has changed a lot, and this is a huge topic. Okay? New topic that uh, the people are moving slowly and it's pity, but it begins to have much more popular papers. I think for Australia it's essential, is ecological economic history. To try to explain or to predict what will happen today, studying what has happened in the past. Okay, for example, uh, the impact of climate change and shocks in economic activities. Or for example, how agricultural production adjusts to different shocks. Or for example, how much is the tarot these papers? I think that it is more or less uh, finished these papers about the, the how much uh, natural resources we destroyed with this climatic change and economic activities. But there are a lot of things to do on this, okay? It's a new area, and there are still very few papers, but there are a lot of things. Again, you need big data, okay? You are working with very little. Advanced demography issues, family formation, health, and so on, again, with a different approach that was pioneered by the people making anthropometrics, that is to look this, you know, go to a hospital, take the records of the hospital, and with the records of the hospital, understand a lot of things, and can not be observed only looking at the census, population census, and so on. Another topic that is, is buoyant and everybody knows is African economic history. And this is uh, very interesting because my colleagues say mainly 95% of the papers are produced by people that live in OCD countries. Okay? And the people that produce papers, many of these people are also white because are from South Africa. And, and this is a, a, the new topic now, I, I say that before, is new developments of developing countries with their poor. We have a lot to do in developing countries. We know really little, and we have a lot to do. And obviously, developing countries' history. And mm, I think that the new, the new topic, the hot topic now is Asian countries more than Latin America. The American countries now is a bit of fashion. I think that people are not so interested and are too much in the sense of the debate based on the idea of institutional failure, that is the Latin American debate, and to move much more to the Asian countries. You know, there are a lot of things to do, you know, for example, about India or about the, or Vietnam, Indonesia, and so on. And also, it's very interesting, many of these countries have incredible good data because the colonies collect a lot of data, that is, <laughs> this means that you can make a lot of studies because they are much more data than the people think, okay? It's different when you, the country become independent and probably the quality of data go down, but you can do a lot of things. And obviously we have all this, something that is very difficult, and, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, Jeff Williams a pioneer a lot, is this establishment of comparative system. okay? One thing that worries me when I, I, I read the submissions 
on the European, you can write a paper about Sweden, but this paper should be international. You should connect your paper to the international debates. This never happened in the American papers. Okay, the United States paper never connected the paper with the international debates. But I think that the rest of the world, when we talk about what happened in Sweden, for example, we should say this is relevant for this broad literature and this is the implication for another literature. If we make this kind of history, we will make more relevant. Okay. To summarize my view, I, I tend to be uh, optimistic about the, the next years of economic history. We have a lot to do. Probably it's not so worse the situation about 10 years ago, but as usual, we should fight to survive, and it's part of your job uh, to be uh, better and to be competitive. So this is all. All right. Well, thank you very much, Joan and Jane. Um, I think there's a lot to all of both of those papers, and hopefully the recordings will be um, great to go back and have a look at and perhaps think on a little bit more. What was kept coming back in my mind, though, was the experience, the similarity of experience, but also the identification of the key topics and so on. So uh, I was quite buoyed by uh, a lot of that discussion. Um, Abel, you're next up. Abel Gwen Debbie. You're able to share your screen. Um, yes. Uh, can you hear me? I can indeed. I can indeed. Can you share your screen? Yes. Let's see. Host, uh, disabled participant. Uh, can you uh, allow me? As a. Yes. Uh, well, thank, thank you for joining us so early in the morning, Abel. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> it wasn't my fault, folks, all right? It wasn't my fault. Yeah, probably it's me. Do, do you see my slides yes. now? Yes, if you, if you say, um, if you start from the beginning now, we should be right. Is that um, okay now? Uh, yeah, I think you've actually shared your second screen, like the first screen. Um, yes, let me try to uh, maybe just duplicate them. Uh, is it okay now? I think that's good. Yes, thank you very much, Abel. Well, thanks again for joining us so early in your part of the world. I'll leave you to it. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, and greetings from uh, Sweden. I, uh, I, my name is Abel Gwaindepi. Uh, I'm originally from Zimbabwe. And uh, I came to Sweden as a postdoc at Lund uh, University in the Department of Economic History. After, a finish, uh, after finishing uh, a PhD at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Uh, so I, I've been at Lund University from around 2008, October to uh, um, now. And I'm in a process of moving to uh, uh, a new job at the Danish Institute of International Studies. And uh, the, the presentation today uh, is really not uh, a com complete uh, proposal. Uh, I can even say not even a paper. So it's an idea uh, I have regarding um, uh, comparing the Cape Colony to Western Australia. And so uh, I welcome any suggestions and, and, and thoughts uh, on this. Yes, so uh, just a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, the, since this is a summit, I can also just um, probably use this uh, opportunity to introduce uh, myself and my background in economic history. Uh, so my PhD uh, from Santa Bush was around state building in the colonial era. This is the title. Uh, I was looking at three main themes, uh, which is uh, public revenue or taxation, uh, public expenditure uh, and borrowing patents uh, in the British Cape Colony between 1820 and 1910. Uh, so the, these were the primary uh, themes uh, that I, uh, I was focusing on, taxation, uh, looking at inland revenues uh, and also trade uh, uh, taxes, uh, public expenditure, you know, looking at public works, uh, road infrastructure, rail construction, uh, as well as social spending, and uh, spending on ad ad administration and order. Um, 
uh, and also public uh, borrowing, which is uh, basically, I think, if you uh, can put it in a different way, is uh, looking at capital flows, uh, mainly from the British uh, capital markets. And uh, when I was doing this, then I realized that the uh, minerals, of course, played a very important role. And I also kind of developed this uh, keen interest on uh, extractivism uh, and economic development uh, in general. Uh, and uh, as uh, David mentioned earlier, my focus uh, in terms of data was mainly from the so-called blue books uh, 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 of the Cape uh, Colony. And, and unfortunately for me, uh, these were already uh, digitized and they are available through the British online archive. So it was uh, really uh, a matter of uh, spending time uh, downloading the uh, scanned documents and then transcribing to uh, uh, the, some of the data to Excel uh, spreadsheet. Uh, do you still hear me well? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, so that's what I did for my uh, PhD. And so the, the next question was, of course, uh, we know the publish uh, or perish story uh, very well. Uh, so what I've tried to do is to really try and uh, push my PhD work um, to really a few journals that I, of course, could uh, uh, manage to, to publish through. And uh, so the re one of the recent papers uh, explored this concept of uh, extractivism and development, uh, where I look at the state and private diamond extraction uh, at the British Cape Colony uh, in this period, which uh, went to uh, this journal, uh, the extractive industries and society. And I think this is in line with what John was saying about maybe sometimes it's good to target uh, uh, journals which are outside uh, economic uh, history journals. And uh, this is what exactly uh, I did with uh, a former student um, here at Lund University uh, who was interested in uh, uh, the Cape Colony as well. Uh, but also, I, I think one of the uh, battles um, personally I have, and I think this can be true for all youngsters, I, I think worldwide, who are trying to enter into this uh, historical topic, is that you uh, often think about these uh, labor market uh, dynamics. For instance, I'm from Africa. Uh, you don't often have uh, an obvious uh, uh, department. Uh, there's very few economic history departments in Africa. At Stellenbosch, I was part of economics department. We were a small unit. So you often think about your employability beyond uh, uh, your interest in economic history. So here I was trying to uh, diversify and talk about you know, fiscal systems uh, in uh, contemporary times to really try and speak to uh, uh, some of these uh, contemporary issues and also be uh, uh, dynamic in terms of branding myself uh, beyond uh, being an economic hist uh, uh, historian. And I think, you know, for this reason, I think it's, it's, it's also partly uh, 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 a way I could motivate my application uh, for a job at the uh, Danish uh, research organization to, um, and, and, and I could try and sell myself, you know, with this kind of different uh, 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 branding or uh, uh, strategy. So I highlight this uh, article here, uh, also referring to what John was saying, uh, the idea of, you know, you have to really push your work. And it was through this, of course, publication that uh, David uh, uh, emailed me and my uh, PhD mentor, uh, Johan, and we managed to get in contact. And of course, if I had focused, for instance, after my PhD on a book <clears throat> project, probably uh, that book would have taken two years or three years, and, and maybe without these uh, journal articles, my work wouldn't have been uh, visible to, other, uh, to others uh, uh, as uh, of yet. And uh, so this is what I've tried to do to avoid uh, perishing. OK, so the next one is really, uh, I think it's relevant for what we're trying to do with this comparative angle. So recently, and uh, this was also thanks to uh, uh, John, who just presented uh, with his uh, help uh, as uh, an editor in terms of really shaping my uh, paper. So I recently pushed my paper in the European Review of Economic History, where I tried to uh, use my case, uh, the Cape Colony, uh, to really explore um, other areas. And, and I think the journey was uh, slightly difficult. And, and here, 
uh, uh, this paper is of course available uh, now um, as an early view. And what I do in the paper is really to try and not do a, uh, you know, if you like an equal compar comparison in terms of really putting these uh, circular columns at an equal footing, but I try to, if you like, read the history of the Cape Colony uh, uh, on the fiscal front. Uh, I try to read uh, that history through uh, uh, other circular colonies. And, and, and so perhaps if you go through it, you realize I don't, of course, do justice to the other uh, uh, regions because my focus is really trying to understand uh, the Cape Colony in comparative uh, uh, terms. And uh, uh, the idea was really driven. Sorry. Oh, okay. no, no, carry on, Abel. I think someone coughed. Uh, oh, all right, thanks. Uh, the idea was really um, uh, driven by this idea that, uh, well, settlers uh, were willing to pay an uh, unusually high taxes, you know, and, and this is kind of uh, established, you know, in order to uh, really assert uh, 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 their uh, autonomy and uh, to allow our self uh, government to be uh, 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 granted. And of course, for the imperial authorities, uh, uh, self government was, was a mechanism to allow the rule of law. Uh, and also to enforce market discipline, uh, especially on uh, issues surrounding uh, 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 financial self-sufficiency, self because the running of the British Empire, you know, the, the arguments that, you know, became very expensive and, and the uh, British taxpayers were, of course, not very happy to, to, do, uh, to, to finance it. And so uh, my, my uh, bringing the Cape Colony, which was less uh, explored uh, in terms of economic history. Of course, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand uh, were really uh, relatively well-trodden uh, uh, regions in terms of economic history. So what I try to do in the paper is to, to, to say, okay, what happened uh, the, uh, when the uh, responsible go uh, government institutions were, uh, uh, you know, met different or even tough conditions? Uh, and, and the question I ask here is whether uh, the willingness to show the high tax burden uh, by the colonists were, uh, was generalized throughout the British Empire and I uh, used uh, the Cape. And of course, the, one of the challenges I encounter is that once you start to, to do that, you, and you have a problem because then uh, the population structure or dynamics uh, are different. And uh, here I just showed the uh, picture and of course the the cap is outstanding in terms of the uh, indigenous or I think in Australia they're called uh, abor uh, Aboriginals uh, or uh, uh, groups and and and, and that uh, is really important in how some of the institutions which were important for, from uh, uh, Britain were to be operationalized uh, uh, in the colonies and here of course I was focusing on fiscal uh, systems uh, and 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 in the paper I tried to to go through, uh, uh, really uh, uh, collect uh, as much uh, uh, data as possible in terms of what has been done uh, for other colonies, but for the Cape, I do use my own uh, data. And, and here I just demonstrate that when we think of fiscal systems, of course, trade uh, taxes were very important uh, historically, uh, even uh, I think uh, into the uh, uh, 20th century as well. Which is uh, yes, uh, so, so, so the idea I push in the paper uh, is that, so perhaps if we want to understand fiscal systems, uh, we'll need to look beyond uh, trade taxes. And, and uh, this allows us to venture into what the literature sometimes call the uh, hard to collect uh, uh, types of taxes, uh, such as income taxes and, and, and uh, uh, mostly uh, direct uh, forms of uh, taxes, uh, because then they kind of uh, uh, imply that the, the tax authorities have to have some kind of uh, uh, relationship with the uh, tax payer. Yes, so in the paper, I think uh, the main idea that I try to show is uh, some kind, uh, uh, this picture of, uh, if you like, uh, divergence uh, uh, of the Cape Colony uh, when we think of uh, uh, this relationship with the other colonies, for instance, here we see around 76, uh, there was a bit of tendency for it to catch up, uh, uh, at least in terms of the tra trajectory of the tax to GD uh, GDP ratio. But we see, uh, uh, you know, this trend is really reversed uh, uh, onwards. And of course, in the paper, I explore 
uh, are some of the reasons or potential reasons uh, 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 mainly focusing on the elite uh, uh, politics. And so, um, yeah, so after doing this paper, uh, something that uh, really uh, made me think harder is the, 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 this business of comparisons, you know, uh, and the question is really, what can one say uh, at this higher level of production uh, versus uh, what you can think of as uh, more nuanced uh, uh, comparisons? Uh, and and, and the, 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 the realization also is that it takes time to develop uh, a full understanding uh, when one ventures into uh, new cases. And, and of course, if you read the paper, I think you will probably pick one or two uh, maybe wrong assumptions uh, that I might have uh, because I'm primarily thinking about the cap, which I know a little bit better uh, 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 with regards to uh, these historical developments. Uh, and, and, and so I think uh, progress is quicker, uh, probably and efficient when uh, one starts to uh, collaborate with what I call uh, local uh, uh, expertise, uh, people who are actually uh, uh, fully knowledgeable, and, and this is what we're trying to do with, uh, with David uh, uh, and um, uh, Andrew as well, in terms of some kind of uh, exploring these collaborative avenues. Uh, and, 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 and hopefully, uh, we also talking about a potential exit volume to, to, to see if uh, you know, we can group together uh, expertise from uh, experts from uh, uh, these several uh, sector colonies. Yes, uh, since the, the, the paper is not really yet developed, so I just kind of uh, started to think about uh, some of the, if you like, uh, 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 building blocks uh, to understand uh, these two colonies. And here I just have uh, GDP per capita, uh, exports per capita, and debt uh, uh, levels. And, and the idea uh, is really to, to, to use, of course, uh, as uh, Jane was saying, that maybe there's need to uh, combine these uh, quantitative uh, uh, approaches with qualitative uh, narrative uh, uh, approaches. And, and, and of course, I'm um, being not an expert in uh, Western Australian uh, history, uh, I will have to rely on the uh, uh, other collaborators here, um, which is in this case, uh, David and uh, Andrew. And we just trying to, to explore these uh, issues further, but I think the, the, uh, these economic uh, 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 measures, uh, I think provides uh, 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 a platform for us to, to, to explore uh, even uh, much more qualitative uh, angles. And, and I think what we see, uh, for instance, here in terms of GDP per capita, uh, in comparative terms, we see that the cap uh, uh, is relatively uh, lower. I put um, <coughs> uh, uh, in brackets the, 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 the GDP per capita if we exclude, of course, the uh, indigenous people uh, to only look uh, at the settler enclaves, but I also include the, the total population uh, just to uh, bring that nuance uh, that, of course, the population dynamics at the CAP uh, 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 were different. Um, and yeah, maybe let me not. Uh, Dig further uh, in terms of that and uh, move to the next slide. Yes, uh, so besides the economic um, sphere, uh, I'm also trying to think in terms of uh, the political sphere, uh, because I think if we understand the, the uh, economic sphere, what's uh, going on, what are the uh, uh, major uh, economic staples and in terms of mining exports and, and whatnot, I, th I think we we can be able to answer uh, better this question about pragmatism uh, uh, and economic development. So here I have this uh, table that uh, tries to look at uh, some of the progresses uh, made on the political front, and and I just uh, uh, use uh, different uh, measure. And 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 interesting uh, what we see uh, I, I highlight for instance here some kind of reversal if you were to compare Cape Colony with uh, Western Australia in terms of uh, male suffrage. Uh, we see that over time, we expect uh, uh, things to improve, but of course, at the CAP, things started well, uh, but there's some kind of uh, reversal that we see. And, and, and overall, when we consider uh, democratic consolidation, of course, democ uh, democracy is in court uh, here because it's really 
uh, some authors uh, prefer to call it limited uh, uh, democracy. Uh, we also see that uh, things are not going in the right direction. And here I put uh, uh, the consolidation maybe is happening if we think strictly of the settler enclave. But when we bring the whole population uh, uh, dynamics, we realize that maybe it's not quite working quite well because that, that, that's when we, uh, in this period, we had uh, uh, in, in the cap a series of uh, reversal of uh, uh, rights, uh, especially when you think of the indigenous populations and, and, and uh, uh, a lot of introductions in terms of thresholds or asset ownership and, and which were effectively meant to exclude the uh, indigenous uh, Africans from uh, uh, the voting rights. I, of course, am not very um, intimately uh, knowledgeable uh, on uh, what, uh, what was going on in Western Australia uh, with uh, this regard. Yes, uh, and so uh, this is just, of course, uh, still preliminary, uh, trying to think about the welfare uh, state, how, uh, you know, how did the, 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 the state uh, evolve in terms of uh, trying to uh, spend money on uh, various uh, um, spheres, such as education, health, and, and, and here, of course, I use uh, the uh, shares in uh, total expenditure to look at uh, the welfare state. I think Australian uh, literature talks a lot about the so-called colonial socialism and, and it's something that I've been thinking about. And, and of course, events uh, uh, in the Cape Colony uh, evolved uh, a bit differently. And here, I think I also probably will need to uh, uh, think in terms of uh, separating the settler enclave to uh, the from the entire uh, population that includes uh, the indigenous people. So the 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 idea that's kind of the idea of the paper. We we are trying to think of colonial uh, pragmatism and economic development, and so we have this uh, economic sphere where we uh, try to get some some of these uh, statistics, but also the uh, political sphere. And 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 here we're trying to get to. Uh, explore a bit on the, uh, the, the role of the state as an enabler of economic development, but also uh, as an actor. And we're also trying to think about the ideology uh, um, in terms of uh, here, uh, the role of the political and uh, economic elite, especially in these formative years uh, 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 of uh, uh, colonial development in these two colonies. Uh, and, and of course, the, the, the big topic, and I think it's more even important for the CAP, here's the contested place for uh, the indigenous people. And, and, and in the paper uh, I showed, uh, um, I kind of talk about yeah, the, that moral economy uh, that developed uh, uh, at the CAP and, and what it meant in terms of uh, um, this consensus uh, within the settler enclave uh, regarding the place and role of the indigenous population uh, uh, in the economy. Uh, and, and these things are, of course, important. And, and, and that's the way kind of think about opportunities and uh, constraints of being uh, part of the British Empire. And, and, and yeah, so these are some of the, uh, I think, areas uh, we will uh, try to explore um, when thinking about pragmatism and you know, economic development. And, and yeah, uh, I think it has been uh, a long day for most, and I will uh, receive comments and, and, and maybe uh, questions. Uh, thank you. Let me stop sharing. Uh, any questions? Uh, no one has a hand up. I'm going to, to start off, Abel. Uh, there's another angle as well. You're comparing, or we're looking to compare WA and um, South Africa, of course. Um, what's your perspective of the London angle on that? So the centre of empire and um, uh, the, the empire's uh, fundamental role in all of this. Um, do you have any thoughts or are you thinking about that at this stage? Um. Yes, uh, so that's uh, a very important uh, aspect, and I think it's it's, it's part uh, of my last point that I, I try to highlight uh, the role, um, I mean, opportunities and constraints of being part of the British Empire, and 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 I think in my reading of the cap, at least, uh, you do see that uh, you know the, 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 there are these debates uh, about 
Sisu Jong was, of course, as a key political and economic figure in the CAP. Uh, and, you know, the, the, there's this understanding that he really could be uh, an outright liberal uh, when it suits, uh, when it was convenient. But when uh, 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 different issues were at stake, of course, he easily uh, wanted to uh, 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 rely um, on the Queen as help and, 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 and uh, really rely on the imperial authorities to, to really come uh, for uh, his help. So I think the, those dynamics are very important in, 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 you know, in, our, in terms of understanding what's going on in these colonies. And yeah, the, for the paper, I think, yeah, it, it could be, I'm not sure whether it should be a big uh, 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 theme uh, running through, but, but I think uh, it's an important uh, consideration. Thank you. Absolutely. There's certainly uniformity amongst all the colonies that they use uh, at the centre of empire when they need to, and then they claim um, you know, like independence uh, when that's a, a good way to go, which I'm sure we're all, uh, we can all understand. Uh, any other comments or queries? Well, just yeah, Michael. I imagine this sort of comparison might be enriched if there's some characters in there, but that is a governor feeling a certain character equivalence in the, the Cape or an administrator of some sort, or somebody from pastoral activity, or just some point of reference so that they become concrete as yeah. to what the comparison, what the nature of the activities is being done and the people involved in the process. Sorry, Abel, did you hear that comment? Um, I think it's because the, the audience, uh, uh, it's not quite uh, clear to me, maybe you can repeat. Uh, yeah, so Michael was just saying, um, using characters, uh, if you like, as foils for demonstrating this, so governors or other important characters as one way to um, uh, one way to uh, unwind the sort of to pull apart the spaghetti and to, to see what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, uh, I think uh, that's the the point I was trying to highlight with uh, the role of the political and economic elites, and and, and yeah, and and one has to scale in terms of how, uh, how deep uh, one goes or can that be a separate uh, uh, paper altogether um, that looks at these uh, characters and governors and maybe their tenure uh, as well. Yeah. So, and one of the other things is the increasing professionalization of the gubernatorial profession across the empire as well, I think, uh, as time goes on, especially after the 19, turn of the, the 1900s. Um, I will thank you very much. Thank you everyone for um, sticking it out. I know it's been a, a long day, hopefully a uh, fruitful day. Certainly I've enjoyed the papers and I've found the, um, the discussion uh, really interesting across to what, what are we doing as well as specific examples. Um, thank you so much. I'll be in touch for next year's and hopefully you'll be able to come along then as well uh, and look forward to perhaps seeing you in the springtime as well. All the best. Thank you, David.